Hey, um, thanks for that uh, introduction and thanks for having me uh, on, on the call. Uh, pleasure to be uh, speaking uh, with you all. Apologies for doing it uh, virtually. I would have loved to have uh, combined uh, going to this conference with a long weekend in Sydney, uh, but that was not meant to be. Uh, and, and indeed, the fact that I can just sort of pop in on Teams, uh, you know, I think I'll talk about this a little bit towards the end uh, of my intervention, but I think it speaks to the incredible uh, potential of digital technologies that they bring for a sort of small and isolated uh, economy like Aotearoa New Zealand. All right, now the, the timing, I, well, actually before I heard those opening remarks, I was thinking that the timing for me giving a sort of a, a near term uh, what's changed economic update was a little bit tricky because we've got an NPS, a monetary policy statement coming out uh, in a few weeks. Uh, so I'm not going to talk much about sort of near term economic uh, issues uh, and developments, uh, but I um, I, I will talk about the inflation uh, number that came out last week, but I'll just sort of uh, stick to the facts. I won't sort of interpret it uh, in any way because I don't want to preempt uh, conversations around the Monetary Policy Committee table that are yet to take place. And of course, we will give a full readout uh, on our view of the world on November 23rd uh, with our next uh, NPS. So what I am going to talk about, which follows on nicely actually from those introductory uh, remarks, is sort of the broader economic context uh, that's shaping that sort of near-term outlook uh, and recent data developments. Um, so I'll start with a look at uh, New Zealand's sort of big picture economic dynamics uh, over recent years. Then we'll spend a few minutes uh, talking about the, the global economy uh, and what's been going on there and the effect that it's likely to have uh, on New Zealand. Uh, and then I'll end with a few thoughts on sort of the supply side uh, of the New Zealand economy and how events playing out uh, in that space could uh, work to our advantage uh, over the medium to longer term or, or, or not depending on how we play our cards. So, you know, that all might sound like it's sort of a bit big picture and a bit real uh, in terms of the real side of the economy for a, a, a conference aimed at bond traders. Uh, but as I said, it's quite consistent with those openary, opening remarks. You know, we are living uh, through extraordinary times. Uh, it's a really unique and a uniquely challenging period in our economic history. Uh, and I think that sort of understanding the big picture is fundamental, um, certainly for a monetary policymaker uh, in terms of not messing it up. Uh, and indeed, uh, for bond traders and banks, I think having a deep understanding of the economic fundamentals uh, of what we're living through right now is also critical in getting it right, uh, whatever that means. Um, to you, not screwing up in terms of your portfolios uh, and positions, uh, given the tremendous uh, volatility uh, in the economy and financial markets that we're currently experiencing. All right, so let's start with New Zealand. Uh, we'll start with inflation. Let's look the beast, the monster in the eye. Uh, inflation came out last week for Q3. It was stronger than pretty much everybody expected. Uh, in terms of the Reserve Bank, we had a 6.4% annual increase in CPI inflation uh, in our August monetary policy statement, uh, and it came in at 7.2%, so quite a uh, an overshoot there from what we were expecting. Uh, both tradables and non-tradables inflation were higher than expected, so non-tradables, sort of homegrown uh, inflation pressures came in at 6.6% uh, versus our expectation of 6.3%. Uh, so not too much of a surprise there, but still a big number. Uh, and that big number was driven in large part by construction costs uh, and local council, local authority rates uh, made large contributions as expected. Uh, and when you sort of get down into that data, you can see evidence of a, a sort of shift in consumer spending uh, from goods uh, back to services combined with a very tight uh, labour market. You can see evidence of that throughout uh, the CPI data. Now, the biggest forecast error that we did make was in terms of tradables uh, inflation. So this is inflation coming over the border. Uh, that came in at 8.1%, uh, whereas we were expecting 6.5%. Um, so that was due to a, we had a 17% quarterly increase uh, in fruit and vegetable prices, a uh, huge number, and we had a 20% quarterly increase in international airfares uh, as our border has progressively reopened. 
Um, we did have a 4.5% decline in petrol prices, which was a bit of a partial offset. Now, a point I want to make here, tradables inflation is usually our friend. Uh, so over recent uh, history, recent decades, it has been low to negative uh, across the globe. And that's for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, you know, globalization, a sort of slow moving positive uh, supply shock has kept a lid on global prices. Uh, relatedly, the Chinese labor market, so Chinese uh, moving from sort of farms uh, in the West to factories in the East, and China being the uh, workshop for the world, has also contributed to low tradables inflation and favorable demographics uh, across a bunch of countries has also contributed. Um, but much of that is changing uh, at the moment. So in the first instance, uh, that's because of the pandemic uh, and associated supply shocks. But globalization uh, is also changing. De uh, demographics are changing. And, and China uh, isn't the deflationary force that it once was. So there's talk uh, and serious uh, academic papers arguing that greater international inflationary pressure uh, could be a theme uh, going forward. Obviously, uh, hopefully not as extreme as what we've been witnessing over the last year or so, but that era of helpful tradables inflation uh, may be coming to an end. All right, so how did we end up with inflation at 7.2% uh, in New Zealand, a rather unpleasant situation for all of us? Um, so let's just take a quick look back over the last two and a half years or so. Uh, it's obviously been a very bumpy ride uh, in terms of GDP. We've seen heaps of volatility. Uh, over the last few years, uh, given sort of intermittent uh, lockdowns and associated uh, health uh, sort of aspects of the health response. Uh, but overall, the New Zealand economy uh, has uh, done, done incredibly well over COVID. We sort of roared through COVID. Um, we did see spending decline during lockdowns, but then it would just sort of roar back out of lockdowns, uh, you know, as they came to an end. So the reasons for that, you know, we saw a very strong uh, policy response uh, to the health emergency. We saw big uh, government spending on things like the wage subsidy. Uh, and of course, we had uh, ultra low interest rates. Uh, our health response was also really effective. We pretty much eliminated COVID uh, up until the end, oh, sorry, up until the start of this year. So for about an 18 month period there, uh, for many of us, life sort of went back to normal. Uh, while most of the rest of the world was battling and dealing with the virus. Uh, another reason demand stayed strong in our economy over this period is that we got really good at using uh, digital technologies to work and to shop from home. So we saw a big lift uh, in the digital economy. Well, anything uh, involving face-to-face -face, uh, connection or contact took a major hit, which is a, a, a global story. Uh, that dynamic is ongoing uh, to a large extent, this process of digital adoption. Uh, pandemics, they often sort of uh, reinforce or accentuate trends that were already underway uh, in the economy and in society, and digital adoption is clearly one such trend. Um, other reasons why our economy stayed strong over that period, household balance sheets uh, actually strengthened uh, over the pandemic. New Zealanders, we actually saved uh, over the pandemic. Uh, the housing market, which we'll talk about more in a minute, also helped strengthen household balance sheets with uh, house prices uh, going up pretty strongly over that period. Um, so, you know, even now, there's still a good buffer there on average uh, household balance sheets are still in reasonably good shape. Uh, the labour market has also been uh, crazy strong uh, throughout the pandemic. We've got unemployment uh, around 3.3%. Uh, the employment rate uh, has been around record highs. Um, so workers, again, a global story here, but workers have been becoming increasingly difficult to find, which is a you know a fundamental change uh, for New Zealand businesses. Uh, the the, the labour market has really been a rock, sort of supporting strong demand in our economy over recent years. So for all of those reasons, a strong health response, uh, household balance sheets in reasonable shape. Uh, really low unemployment, strong labour market more generally, domestic spending and demand has stayed uh, pretty robust. 
Uh, of course, you know, as I mentioned, it took big hits uh, during lockdowns, particularly the one in March 2020. Um, but then, you know, as I said, it's spending would just come roaring back out of those lockdowns. Uh, we're also currently seeing uh, tourism grow back reasonably strongly, uh, essentially from zero. Uh, over recent months. Um, so, you know, that's that's the dem demand side of the New Zealand economy, and it's been a story of strength, uh, at least so far. All right, so but on, on the supply side of the economy, and again, this is a global story, uh, it's been a story of constraints, uh, perhaps most obviously uh, migration, net working age migration, uh, fell off a cliff uh, going into COVID, uh, what with the border being shut and all. Uh, and net migration now is still negative uh, currently, but it is forecast to slowly pick up. Um, so, you know, this is another fundamental change uh, in New Zealand's economic model, if you like. Traditionally, we've grown our economy. Uh, New Zealand businesses, we you know, grow our businesses by throwing workers uh, at them, uh, but that model is sort of looking less likely going forward. I think migration inflows are always going to be important uh, and beneficial for the host uh, uh, country and for the, the migrant, uh, but there are increasing signs that the days of very large inflows of low-cost labour uh, into the country may be uh, behind us. Uh, and indeed, if you ask New Zealand businesses, labour is currently the biggest constraint uh, limiting production uh, across across New Zealand businesses currently. All right, so demand holding up. Um, you know, demand has changed in composition. It sort of went from services to goods during that lockdown period, uh, and now it's going back to services. Uh, on top of a very tight labour market, we've had relative uh, plight, uh, price shocks spilling over the borders, uh, given supply chain issues uh, and the war in Europe. So, of course, that equals inflation, 7.3% in Q2 of this year, 7.2% uh, in Q3, obviously too high. Um, but as you uh, no doubt expect, uh, from a central banker, we expect to see inflationary pressures easing uh, going forward. Uh, you know, we're hopeful that it has peaked. Uh, and why do we think that? I just want to run through a few reasons uh, why we see inflation moderating. Um, and I think, you know, in no small part, it's because monetary policy works. Um, so the OCR, the official cash rate, uh, has increased from 25 uh, basis points uh, over the sort of lockdown period. Uh, it's currently 3.5% with uh, financial markets pricing in further uh, rate hikes uh, to come, as was mentioned uh, in the introduction. So this is a very rapid uh, tightening in monetary policy, and it is starting to have an effect. Uh, there are early signs that the economy is starting to cool, uh, that demand and supply in our economy are coming back closer into balance. Now, one, I guess the most obvious sign is falling house prices. Uh, so house prices are down about 10% uh, in aggregate uh, from their high, which was last November, uh, I think the end of last year. Uh, but some of the uh, major centres have seen uh, significantly larger declines in house prices over recent months. Um, you know, partly that's about higher interest rates, um, but it's also about more sort of fundamental factors. So slower population growth, uh, looser zoning uh, regulations across uh, major cities. Um, so, you know, again, this is a big change for the New Zealand economy. Traditionally, we've sort of traded houses amongst ourselves at ever increasing prices, uh, thinking that we were creating prosperity, uh, but that's not what's going on currently. So we're sort of seeing a reverse uh, wealth effect, uh, which should work to slow down consumption. Uh, related to that, we're also seeing signs of a slowdown in construction activity. Uh, consents, building consents have been and continue to be very strong, uh, but code of compliance, uh, work put in place, uh, that sort of stuff is starting to slow. Uh, and that's certainly consistent with what we're hearing from industry contacts. Uh, unfortunately, construction here, it's a, it's a boom bust industry and we've actually, uh, it's been booming. We've actually been building quite a few houses uh, over past a uh, couple of three years. 
uh, which is which is great and part of the reason why we're seeing uh, this moderation in house prices. Uh, but there are lots of signs uh, pointing to a sort of upcoming bust or at least a significant uh, slowdown in construction activity. Now let's sort of turn to the international uh, front, the global economy, and it's that kind of a question of, of where to start. Uh, financial market turmoil, growing signs of stress uh, in the global economy, global inflation is nudging double dig digits. Uh, we're seeing a coordinated tightening uh, across central banks in most uh, economies, certainly developed economies. We're seeing US dollar strength, uh, meaning currency uh, depreciations uh, for the rest of us. And of course, we're seeing a bear market uh, in equities. Now, I think, you know, when you get beyond the sort of hurly-burly of financial markets uh, and look at longer-run trends uh, in the global economy, you know, those longer-run trends are also giving us plenty to think about. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a sense that globalisation is changing uh, compared to what we've become used to uh, over recent decades. We've got huge geopolitical tensions uh, in the global, and, you know, the global economy is sort of splintering into factions or clubs of countries. We've got a war in Europe uh, and China uh, has uh, a number of significant uh, issues confronting policymakers there and then it's sort of starting to turn inwards uh, a little bit uh, again. Um, we're also seeing governments getting bigger uh, across the developed world. There's been a structural rise in spending and investment uh, across many countries. Um, to start with, that's been about fighting COVID, fighting the pandemic. Uh, but population ageing uh, means greater expenditure on health care. Uh, geopolitical tensions, tensions means greater spending on defence. Uh, climate change and energy security mean more investment uh, in renewables and the like. Uh, and of course, active uh, industry policies are coming back into favour. Now, offsetting this sort of tendency towards greater government spending uh, is the fact of ageing population. So older people, they tend, as we age, we tend to save more, uh, meaning higher savings in aggregate, which tends to sort of dampen uh, aggregate spending uh, in the economy, but who knows how that's all going to play out. All right, so there's some fundamental shifts uh, going down around us. It's certainly a great time to be doing economics. Uh, the optimist uh, in me thinks that these changes could you know, hopefully be the catalyst uh, for, for sort of allowing the global economy to escape the sort of uh, low growth period that we've been in since the global financial crisis uh, and to tackle uh, some of the major problems confronting us, particularly climate change. Uh, but of course, it could uh, also signal, well, it does signal huge challenges um, from financial market chaos to central banks uh, sort of running low on ammunition uh, and out of control uh, public spending uh, going forward. So certainly uh, it is game on uh, people in terms of navigating our way through all of those challenges. Now, let me end just with a few words on New Zealand's longer term economic prospects. Uh, as I mentioned, two of the key growth drivers in our economy, being the housing market and strong inward migration, uh, has fundamentally changed. Uh, the dynamics there have changed, at least for the meantime, which sort of raises the question, you know, where is economic growth going to come from in future? Um, I did a number of years at the Productivity Commission, so it's pretty natural for me to say it's going to come from a lift in our productivity uh, of course, and I think that now is the perfect time uh, to finally fix our relatively poor productivity performance. Now, that's a huge challenge in itself, transitioning from an economic growth model that's being based on working more hours to one that's based on greater investment and technological adoption uh, is obviously more easily said than done. Uh, we've been in a capital shallow sort of labour intensive equilibrium for some time, and it's kind of worked to some extent, um, but it's a huge challenge to be moving from there to a more investment driven, uh, high productivity growth equilibrium. Uh, but having said that, I think that transition is more possible now uh, than certainly any period in my uh, living memory. And I say that you know, because of technology, we're living through the fourth industrial revolution and behind all the chaos that is our day jobs. 
Uh, and I think the biggest deal for us, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, is that new technology makes it easier for Kiwi businesses to do business over distance. Economists, we talk about lower spatial transaction costs, uh, which allow businesses to expand uh, beyond their geography, both domestically and internationally, uh, makes it easier for small remote firms to connect into large international markets. It makes it easier for Kiwi innovation to be noticed uh, internationally. It makes it easier for us to tell our story. Um, so that's the opportunity uh, as to whether we'll take it, this digital opportunity in front of New Zealand. There's lots of work to be done in that space as well. Education, skills, innovation, regulation, responding to climate change. Uh, again, it's a long list, but the opportunity is there. And I think the biggest sort of uh, mistake that we need to avoid uh, in this work uh, is sort of the failure of imagination based on the assumption that today's regime is going to last forever. Uh, it never does. Change is going to keep coming. Uh, get ready. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for your, uh, for your attention and listening.